It's a pleasure being here, um, and I would like to start with a confession. So, this is my first talk in front of such a great audience. <laughs> yeah, thank you. And so, you know, I've been working with micro front ends for, for a few years. Actually, this was one of my first companies that was like kind of big in a scale. And recently, I joined to this company where we have this amazing product. However, we are still splitting our monolith. And so today what I would like to share with you is some of the insights that I've gained over the years. And let's start with, does anyone here recognize this? Please raise your hands, shout. Yeah, you're not sure what you're seeing? Some of you are confused. So this is the React Create uh, app, uh, generated code from our CLI. Now, it doesn't really matter what framework we use, right? In this case, I use uh, React with TypeScript and Storybook, but we're all just building components, right? Hopefully testing them, having some CSS in them, and then what happens as our app grows? Well, it naturally grows further, right? So our application grows, more components are added, it becomes more and more complex, and so more teams are added. And then, do you start seeing the problem here? More components, more teams, working in the same workspace. So, my name is Daniel Frey. I'm a software engineer at Lemonade, which is an insure tech company, which uses AI and behavioral economics to make insurance much cooler than it is now. I'm also a content creator. Daniel Frey taught me. You can find my podcast and also some articles. It's all about developers. I also live and love meeting and collaborating with people. So if any of you have anything to say to me and want to collaborate on anything, please reach out. And this is my Twitter, where I tweet also about tech. So let's dive in a bit deeper. So. Let's talk about some of the struggles that we get on Monolith. So, you know it already. Last year it was AngularJS. Today it's React. Tomorrow it's Banana.js. It doesn't really matter what framework we use. It's all technologies that keep on evolving and growing. And then, once we see this cool framework, we want to use it in our app. And what happens now, we're locked. Because you have this big monolith, and you want to move away from it, and you want to start having to move to this new framework, which is shiny and cool, but it's too big to move. And so you're basically locked. Which leads me to single deployment, right? So we just have this huge chunk of code, and we have these dependencies, which we keep on changing, because the UI library came out with a new button, and we want to get it in. And so this big build goes out there and redeploys, and it's all going in one chunk, right? In single deployment. And so this costs time, integration, and so also potential failure, right? What if our build fails? And so we have to run it again. It takes more time. And so leads me to the point where we are stuck with also maintaining a large project. And this also costs us time, and it's very hard to maintain, right? So. Last but not least, process overhead. More teams, more dependencies, releases need to be coordinated carefully because you know, you develop this feature and you're really excited about it, and then you need to tell the team that, hey, watch out, because this might break your code there, and so we have to coordinate with each other really carefully, which increases our overhead. And so, we talked about problems. We saw some problems and we identified them. Now, let's talk about some solutions, right? We're here for solutions, I hope. So, the backend guys seem to get already the solution. So, they have this in most companies right now where we have in the backend some microservices architecture, right? Each backend is, is a, it's, each microservice is split into a specific business case and serves the front end. However, in the front end, like we just saw, it's still a monolith. Now, what if we could take some of the principles that they used already in microservices for years now and have them in the front end? So, let me show you something. 
So uh, let me find my mouse. Here it is. So we have this uh, simple application um, where it's about my podcast. I know, branding myself here, sorry. So <laughs> basically, we have this header and a footer. Um, and also have this, these cards, which are from my episode. If you play, you can play the episode if you want. You can like it. And then on top here, uh, we see this mini card. We can check out, right? Um, and then when we click on one episode, we, see, we get more info. And so this app can grow further, right? I could add more features tomorrow to it. It can be like, for example, for my, um, for my content, some premium episode, and if you want to listen to it, you have to buy it. And so I can add more teams, and for example, I want to have here like a section where features, uh, featured episodes are, and so on and so forth. So you can see how complex it can become. Now, what if I told you that what we have seen now were four separate apps? And those apps could be deployed by different teams. And they're all running together. And if I would change the header or just about anything, it would reflect immediately. No need to redeploy my code. It all happens on runtime. <laughs> now, if you're shocked, let's break some things down. So I have the header and the footer split it into its home package. Then the mini cart, which goes to the light cart package. Oh, it's bright, it's pretty cool. Okay, so, and then we get this media player in the player package, and the episode content, and then even the like button right there goes to the like cart package. And so, ultimately what happens is those, is this setup. Different apps and components are split into now different teams, and if I wanted to, I could then have different technology in them, like for this example was Vue. And they're all served in runtime. So that the result is a web application, one big one. However, each app can be owned and deployed in different teams. And so I said it works all as one, but how? Well, does anyone recognize this? This is the logo of Webpack Module Federation plugin. And this is how it all connects together. And so, let's play with it. So, in this short video, I want to show you where, you see the title of my page is hello, and I want to change it to welcome to danielfrey.metalks. And once I saved it, the change is reflected immediately. So I didn't need to redeploy my code, or just do anything, just save it, and it's just right there. And so this is the main power that we get using module federation. Now, it's not really clear what happens here. And so this is the main power that we get. However, let's break then those things up. It all looked like magic, but really it's not that complicated. There are three concepts that we need to keep in mind whenever we use module federation. So the first one is host, remotes, and then we have hosts that require remotes on, at runtime. So there's really no build time here. So we're not rebuilding things. They are consumed in runtime. So let's have a look at the host. A host is an app that consumes remote components. And the way it looks like, it sits basically on top of Webpack, where we get this config file. And there we have the name, which is basically an application, it's, it's just a name for our app. And then we get this remote object. And the remote object is basically the name of the remote that we want to consume in our app. And then the value that we give to it is where we want to fetch it from. So it can be either S3, if you're familiar with AWS, it can be static hosting, it's up to you. And now, let's talk about remotes. So your app can also expose remotes. Remotes can be consumed by any federated app. And basically the way it looks like is this. We have this exposed object, with the, each of them is basically the value that you wanna expose outside, and then you give it the path. That's it. And now, 
that we have everything in place, we can just import it simply to our application, just like we're used to with just anything. So really nothing new here. So we solved some problems, right? So we achieved micro front ends and basically now split it our teams. And using module federation, we managed to have all those dependencies work together without need to redeploy, and we achieved scalable micro front ends. So you might be wondering who uses micro front ends? So here are a list of some of the companies that use, and one of them is obviously Lemonade, which is the company we work at. And we're splitting now our monoliths and some other tech giants like PayPal, Spotify, and so on. And so then now that they use all these technologies, they enable the teams to deliver faster, have estimated, eliminated dependencies, and many use now the module federation to make it even easier. And so I would like to talk about some obvious questions. Because, right, we all now seen this concept, and we might be wondering some stuff. So let's dive into it. First thing first is duplicated dependencies, right? So you have seen me using React, right, in this case, and there was like many React applications in one page. You might, you might be wondering, like, aren't you then using React more than once? Aren't you then using different versions of it? And so basically, no. <laughs> With Webpack module federation, we have an object called shared, and there we can give it the values that we don't want to have duplicated, and then make sure that it's not been duplicated. Great. Now, what about TypeScript? <laughs> we all love those types, and we want to keep on using them, and so you can easily do that with Webpack Module Federation because we have this plugin called Module Federation slash TypeScript. You can find it out, play with it, and enjoy it. And so we go to versioning. Module Federation is great. We have now runtime, right? Every time you push your changes, it just goes on immediately to your page. And you might feel like in our company, we're not ready. We're not ready yet to have everything go right away. So if I have a header, and then I give it some prop, and then I use it in my application, and all of a sudden it's breaking now, and it's like a major version. So Module Federation doesn't really have an opinion about it. If you want to have versioning, it's fine. You can do it using like feature flags, whatever fits you. So there is also another cool thing that you can install, which is called dependency overview. And that is just like, um, you know this, like uh, some people use it in, in NPM, it can show you like your size of your NPMs and like node modules, how big it is and which package, how much size it takes. So basically there's something similar in module federation where it can show you your dependency your dependencies and what remotes and what hosts you use and so on and so forth, so you can find it there. These are really exciting times. Mojo Federation is, is quite new, and as you can see, some things are, might be tricky for you or not, but it helps your app scale. Your team grow without introducing bottlenecks, and so it solves us a lot of problems. Thank you very much, everyone. I hope that you're going to use this in your place. Thank you.